Good morning. Usually I encourage people to take notes when I'm about to preach, but I pray that you are already taking notes with what Pastor Steve and Pastor Joseph had brought forth so far this morning. We are blessed indeed. Amen? Amen. I took notes. The well, $1.5 million paid off in under two and a half years. The land at Coffee Run, $2 million paid off in under two and a half years. Since the almost four and a half years since we closed on the land, we have all been working hard and believing harder for the fullness of the vision that God has placed on all of our hearts as a church family. And as we begin uh, this week and we open our capital stewardship campaign for the worship center, I can testify to the challenge that American pastors face in preaching on money to history's wealthiest Christians. Dwight L. Moody once said that standing just beside the ministry martyrs in heaven will be the ministry fundraisers. <laughs> Billy Sunday once said that the most sensitive nerve in the body is the one going from the heart to the wallet. But it is precisely that connection where our treasure is, there also is where our hearts shall be. Luke 12, 34. And that is exactly what makes this topic of teaching so very, very full of promise. Do you realize that every time someone takes a step in financial stewardship, they mark a very significant spiritual victory? They are refusing to buy in to the world's deceptions that our self-worth is determined by our net worth. And rightly so, Scripture helps us with this task here today. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. In the Gospels, one out of 10 verses deals directly with the subject of finances. There's an old story of a very, very wealthy man who had over the years grown critical of the church. He had bounced in and out of church over the years and, and, and he had gotten a report that he was ill, terminally ill, and that he'd probably only have about two years left. Well, thank God he, he found a church that he loved. He enjoyed the people. He loved the teaching. But within the last two years of his life, that church had begun a capital stewardship campaign. But this man, glory to God, stuck it out. He loved the church. But then that day came. He knew he was soon to be at death's door. So he called the pastor over. He wanted some comfort. He wanted some company. And he said, Rev, do you think that if I gave all my money to the church, do you think God would then take me in? Seriously, Rev, if I donated everything that I have, do you think then that that would be enough to get in? And the pastor just looked at him and said, I'm not really sure, but... Uh, how about you give it a shot? <laughs> the truth is, this is where we all can be tempted to make our appeal from self-interest or from guilt. We'll just drop a little something in the plate to soothe our conscience or perhaps even purchase a little more favor from God. But Scripture instead invites a response to God of gratitude 
out of joyful obedience, giving that is eager with love because we know without a doubt who gave first. When we respond that way, that is giving that glorifies God. Your outline is broken up into four sections. Your giving will bless others. Your giving will bless you. Your giving will meet needs. And your giving will glorify God. Roman numeral one, your giving will bless others. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. That is God's word. In chapters 8 and 9, Paul was writing to the Macedonians to provoke them in the spirit of giving to the church at Corinth. A time ago, the Corinthians gave in many ways and also motivated many others to give, but they themselves needed to be motivated once again. When we see what God is doing in and through the lives of others, we ought to purpose to serve him better ourselves. However, there is a fine line between fleshly imitation and spiritual emulation. Do you receive that? A Bible-following, Lord-loving, selfless Christian can be the means of stirring up a church and motivating people to pray, to work, to witness, and to give. We find that the Macedonians focused on others, not themselves. This is true humility, not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. That's humility. Not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. In this passage, Paul is basically saying, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand to others. When we stop focusing on our needs, we become far more aware of the needs of others. Philippians 2.7 says that Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. When was the last time you emptied yourself for the benefit of others? You cannot be a servant if you are full of yourself. It is only when we forget ourselves that we do the things that deserve to be remembered. And it's only those things that will ripple throughout eternity. This is known as the doctrine of self-denial, and it is the core of being a faithful steward. Thinking like a servant and a steward is difficult because it challenges the basic problem of our human nature. One, we are by nature selfish. Two, we mainly think most about ourselves. That's precisely why humility is a daily struggle, a lesson we must relearn over and over again. The opportunity to be a servant confronts us a dozen times a day in which we are given the choice to decide between meeting our own needs or the needs of others. Our greatest encouragement for giving is that it pleases the Lord. You must understand that. That is a core teaching of the scripture that Trinity Community Church walks in. Additionally, this portion of scripture that we just read clearly points out that there is nothing wrong with practicing the kind of giving that provokes others to give as well. Your giving will bless others. Roman numeral two. Your giving will bless you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. 
But I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. A mother wanted to teach her daughter about giving. So she gave the little girl a quarter and a dollar for church. The mother said, put whichever one you want in the collection plate and keep the other for yourself. When they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter which amount she had given. Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the dollar. But just before the collection, the man in the pulpit said that we should all be cheerful givers. And I knew that I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the quarter. <laughs> Verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, that's my out, Pastor Robert. There it is. I'm not going to be cheerful, so I'm not going to give. God loves a cheerful giver. This is not a qualification to give, but a conviction in your giving. This is not your exit strategy. This is not your escape clause. And this is not a valid excuse for not giving. Golf clap. All right. Jesus said in Luke 6, 36, give and it shall be given unto you. And that statement by our Lord still holds true today. The good measure he gives back to us is not always money or material goods, but it is always worth far more than anything we could ever give. Giving is not something we do, but something we are. Giving is a way of life for the Christian who understands the grace of God. Real servants think like stewards, not owners. And why? Because they remember that God owns it all. In the Bible, a steward was a servant entrusted to manage an estate. Servanthood and stewardship go together since God expects us to be trustworthy in both. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, moreover, it is required that stewards be found faithful. It is required. To become real servants, we're going to have to settle the issue of money in our lives. Jesus did say, no servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. He didn't say you shouldn't serve both. He said you cannot serve both because it is impossible. Francis Bacon said money is a powerful tool, but a wicked master. Do we really understand that all of our time, all of our money, and all of our abilities belong to God? You and I cannot be a weekend soldier, a weekend Christian, a weekend believer, or a weekend child of God. Living with one hand serving money and one hand serving his majesty will not work. Are you aware that God uses money and material possessions to test our faithfulness to him? But please be warned, money can become your God. Money has been known to buy food and drink, 
fantasy and fiction, hope and dope, love and lust, but money can not buy God. That's Billy Sunday. It is foolish to believe that God will play second fiddle to money. When Jesus is your master, money serves you. But if money is your master, you become slaves. Wealth is certainly not a sin, but failing to use it for God's glory is. Real servants are more concerned about ministry and not money. The giving of money is just as spiritual as the act of singing our worship songs as we did this morning. It's just as spiritual as praying, meeting together in fellowship over a meal, coming to church on Sunday or Wednesday night. And this portion of scripture supports also that money is a seed. If we give it in alignment with scripture, it will multiply to the glory of God and meet many needs. If we use it in ways other than God desires, the harvest will be poor. But 2 Corinthians 9, 11 teaches another truth. If God does choose to enrich us, it is so that we may be even more bountiful. Once the joys of grace giving kick in, that grace giving, that's an old school church term, this is when we find the joy of giving more and more. Everything we have, not just our income, belongs to God. It is God given and it is to be used by God to accomplish his works. Listen, you can prosper financially but still be impoverished. Amen? If what you have only supports you, it will soon die. But if what you have supports ministry in the kingdom of God, it will live all the way into eternity. Grace giving means that we really believe that God is the great giver. And we use our spiritual and material resources accordingly because as Pastor Joseph instructed us this morning, you simply cannot outgive God. And as such, Roman numeral three, your giving will meet needs. 2 Corinthians 9, 12, for the administration of this service, what service? Giving. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. The emphasis in 2 Corinthians 9.12 is on the fact that their offering would meet the needs of the poor saints in Judea. The Gentile believers could have given a number of excuses not to be obedient. They could have said, well, you know, it's not our problem that that territory, you know, became... Uh, riddled with famine, and, and, and now they're poor. It, it, there's, a, there's a church closer to them that can take care of all of their needs. Um, they could have said, well, we believe in giving, but we think that we should first take care of ourselves. Here's probably the most popular excuse in all of Christianity not to give. Well, I'd like to give, but I just can't, say it with me, afford to give right now. John D. Rockefeller said this, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 per week. When a Christian starts to think of excuses for not giving, he automatically moves out of the sphere of grace. Grace never looks for a reason. It only looks for an opportunity. If there is a need to be met, the grace-controlled Christian will do whatever it takes to meet that need. So your giving will bless others, your giving will bless you, and your giving will meet needs. Number four, 
your giving will glorify God. If you haven't taken notes yet, do so now. Because this is what I've bared witness to the faithful, godly people at Trinity Church doing since I came here. It's in our DNA. 2 Corinthians 9, 13 through 15. Wow. Through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You could see right there in verse 13 how your giving will glorify God. When we give ourselves to the obedience of the word, God will be glorified in all areas of our life. Others will actually praise God when they see our obedience to God. One day, a very uh, wealthy, wealthy family took a vacation. It was like kind of a big road trip to the country. And the father had an expressed purpose of showing his son how poor people lived. They spent a couple days and nights on the farm of what would be considered a very, very poor family. On their return from the trip, the father asked the son, son, what did you think of the trip? It was great, dad. Well, did you see how the poor people lived, the father asked. Oh, yeah, said the son. So tell me, what did you learn from the trip, the father asked. And the son answered, I saw that we have one dog, and they had four. We have a pool that reaches into the middle of the yard, and they have a creek that seems to go on to no end. We have imported lanterns in our garden, and they have the stars at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard, and they have the whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on, and they have fields that go beyond our sight. We have servants who serve us, but they serve others. We buy our food. They grow their food. We have walls around our property to protect us. They have many friends around them to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. Then his son added, thank you, Dad, for showing me just how poor we are. Second Corinthians 8, 9 gives testimony. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. We have a video that we'd like to show you right now. And while you're watching this, I want you to really, really receive what you see and what you hear. When you see all of these images and you hear of Pastor Steve and others in leadership share with you the vision for Coffee Run that God has placed on our heart, looking back, make no mistake, this has not been easy. But it is a rare thing when anything good comes easy. We have had our challenges with the land with the stones on the wall. We have even had challenges with our desire to make a simple, very simple left-hand turn. But I stand here before you, all of you, convinced that God would not have called us to do what we are doing if he wasn't willing to provide a way for it to get done, amen? And guess what, church? With all the difficulties thus far, God has given us victory over victory over victory. Can I get a witness? Theodore Roosevelt said, nothing in the world is worth having 
or worth doing unless it means effort. This land, this coffee run is so rich in history. From the beginning, the humble desire was to meet the needs of this community and glorify God in doing so. Now, the years have not always been kind to Coffee Run. Devastating fires have brought down and destroyed most of the structures. And over the years, many thoughts and plans for the land have been proposed, everything from real estate development to schools, but God had other plans in mind for Coffee Run. And Trinity Community Church has been called by God to restore the honor of Coffee Run and to be an even greater blessing in serving this community. You have a pledge card. And on it is our key verse for this time of giving. It's at the bottom. Luke 19, 13. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. I want to close with a testimony that before I was a pastor, I was an entrepreneur. And I wouldn't have listened to the words of our Lord in putting money to work for God's glory. I served the wrong master. I worked for the wrong kingdom. Over the years, I've been around the block uh, in churches prior to landing here at Trinity Community Church. I, I, in fact, pastored at another church in which the experience was so devastating, I actually swore that I would never pastor a church again. We had quit church as a family. I told my wife, I said, "Hun, I said, we're not going to ever be a part of a church again. I'm not going to pastor a church again. I'm just going to travel around and uh, I'm just going to preach and we're going to buy a Winnebago. And she went, sure. Then she asked me what a Winnebago was and I'm not even sure what a Winnebago was. It just sounded romantic. And uh, But then one night, God was stirring something in me. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning and, and I woke up and I just couldn't figure out what the problem was. I just was restless in my soul. And so I turned on the TV and I started channel surfing and I come to a National Geographic special and it was like the dead of winter and the ground was all frozen and cracked and the, 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 the voice of the National Geographic's commentator was kind of like the guy from the Masters, he's talking real low as if the bird can hear him and he's like, you know, if the birdie does not find food soon, she shall certainly die so I'm like now on the edge of the couch and I'm watching this little birdie peck around, and I'm like a Rocky movie. I'm like, hey! And then all of a sudden, after about 15 minutes of watching this, the bird finds a worm, plucks it out of the ground, and I jump off the couch, I'm like, hallelujah! Now the bird can, say it with me, eat and live. But guess what the mama bird did? The camera followed the mama bird, and the mama bird took the worm back to the nest and fed her children. And I realized how selfish I had been. I could feed myself, but I was starving my wife. I was starving my children because we did not have a church family that same week Ava starts uh, playing soccer for the first time and we, we go down to this park and, and her coach was a very handsome yet bald man <laughs> named Dan Elliott over just cavorting bare feet in the field of beautiful grass with the sun aglow upon him was Michael Paraskevich Missy and Catherine. God introduced me to my family. 
They invited me to come to what has historically been my favorite life group, Family Fellowship. And they welcomed us. That same week, I get a phone call from my buddy from my old church. He's a professional sign builder. He builds signs, you put them on the building, the whole thing. And he said, Pastor Robert, my brother is sick, uh, and I just really need help lifting up some signs onto the second story of the building. And I was like, sure, yeah, I can do that. He said, well, it's right around the corner from me. I said, where at? He said, it's that big log cabin right around the corner. I said, what? I said, what's in that big log cabin? Now, he said, a church bought it. I said, oh. Went over there, helped him with the signs, and I said, dude, listen, before we leave, I said, can you introduce me to the pastor? Because, you know, as a traveling preacher, it's how I get my gigs, right? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem, man. I go upstairs and I meet Pastor Steve. And that day I knew that I met a man of God who walks the walk that he talks each and every Sunday. I have learned more from Pastor Steve about being a father and about being a pastor than any family member ever taught me or any seminary ever could teach me. God used these things to heal my heart, to feed me, and to feed my family. And over the years, I have seen things in the godly favor of this church and the generosity that I did not think was possible. I just have been blown away and it still touches me to this day. When I knew that they were raising money to pay off the well, I said, I wanna be a part of that. I wanna be a part of what God is doing at Trinity Community Church, this family of mine. When we knew that the land, Coffee Run, needed to be paid off, I said, I want to be a part of that. I want to do what God is doing in the lives of my family. And we want to be a part of giving in this next round of capital stewardship. We're a family. And I want to be a part of that in every way possible whenever the opportunity arises. And I want to give cheerfully from a heart full of joy because I do know that it's all God's. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord with our time, with our talent, and yes, with our treasure. Will you join me? Let's stand and close in prayer. Father God, we are just so amazed. As I'm praying, I just saw the, the picture of the Easter celebration that we had outside at, at Coffee Run. What did, what did we see? We saw God breaking down denominational divides. It's like, what do you get when you have a Roman Catholic, an Assemblies of God, and a Southern Baptist? You know what you get? You get God's glory coming down on those people that attend. We have seen things, God, that only you can do. We are so, so blessed when we think back to the celebrations that we've had on the land. Father God, a, a, a couple in our own church, the Lumpkins, just honored you in the covenant of marriage on that land. It is clear that that land is special in your sight. And we know that because we serve the God of the latter blessing, that the best is yet to come for Trinity Community Church at the well here at WCS, and yes, at Coffee Run. We all want to be a part of that, Father God, but we could do nothing lest your hand be upon it. So we just thank you, Father God. We just thank you for all of the blessings that you shine down upon us. 
Father God, we are believing that you're going to do something glorious in us, through us, and around us. That coffee run, it's going to be so exciting. The local community is going to be blessed. Others are going to drive down one of the most trafficked streets in all of Delaware, and they're going to go, what is going on there? Look at that parking lot, and you know what? They're going to say, I want to be a part of that. They're going to come in. They're going to feel the love of Jesus and hear the gospel being heralded, and many will come to a saving knowledge of you. Amen, church? Amen. Choirs of angels will sing out and rejoice over the salvation of men. And so, Father God, our, just, our words will never be sufficient to express our gratitude, our love for you. And our thanks, our thanks for teaching us about godly stewardship and where we could see it fleshed out in our spirituality. So we love you, Father God. I pray a blessing as each member today takes home these pledge cards and they pray and they consider how they would be a part. I pray that they receive above and beyond anything that they could ever give. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I'm very thankful that through adoption I can call them family. And so, Father God, we love you only because you loved us first. And as we depart from this place, we know that it is never from your glorious presence. And in Jesus' name, the church of the living God says, amen. God bless you all. I love you. You are dismissed.